coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Shauna Kingstone. I am the uh, president uh, this year of the Wolf Island Historical Society. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our first speaker presentation since 2019. Um, so we're so pleased to have a, a lovely turn at this afternoon. Um, just a couple things before we get started. Uh, if you've never been to the uh, church hall before, we have washrooms here. Uh, refreshments are on the side. Uh, please feel free to help yourself. Um, just a, a quick thing. Our next speaker, uh, which will be on July 16th here in the hall, is actually going to be a panel talk. Um, and the topic is Before Enter Colonization, Haudenosaunee and Black Life on Wolf Island and Kingston. So I think it'll be very interesting. Um, so mark it on your calendars if this is a topic that will be of interest to you. Um, and we will do our best to, uh, to make sure that, um, you know, we're going to try to film it if we can. I'd also like to thank uh, Mike Hill from uh, uh, Aerosnapper Kingston, who is here as a guest, but has also offered to film uh, the um, presentation today. I don't remember. And he's a member. <laughs> Perfect. Hey. Yay! Awesome. 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 Um, okay, any questions before we get started? No, hearing none. I'm going to turn things over to Brian Johnson, who's going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Brian. It's an honor and a privilege to uh, welcome you all back to our annual or, or beginning of our speaker series, which seems to me a lifetime ago since we were, have all gathered together. And uh, uh, Mr. Ron Beaupre and I met at the Toronto Marine Historical Society, uh, God, once upon a time ago, I rode up with Captain Hogan. I've heard every whistle on the Great Lakes that ever blew because he had a eight track recorder. So he plugged that in and we left Kingston and we heard all of the whistle signals for the next three hours riding to Toronto. <laughs> so well, that was a treat in itself. But when we got there, the speaker, I can't remember, but Mr. Beaupre was there, we uh, uh, met. And just recently, uh, recently, this is some time ago, when the anniversary of the East Cliff Hall, which sank in the, uh, near Chrysler Park down in the river, uh, the anniversary was coming up, and naturally I turned to uh, my friend who, uh, if it happened on the seaway, Ron knew about it. Well, he said, I've arranged for you to uh, sit down with me and Constable Lee Caslin, who was there rescuing the crew back in uh, July of uh, July 24th, yeah, 1970, 1970. When, the, when the accident happened. I said, you've got to be kidding. Well, like everything else that's happened in my time, like even when I was president here, I was called away on the Canadian Empress. I was on a boat. And I said, Ron, crap. Yeah, I, I got, I'm on the boat. And Ron, being the gentleman he is, he said, well, how about I do the interview? And I'll turn it over to you. So everything I know about the East Cliff Hall tragedy, I thank to uh, my friend here on the left, I know very, I've heard of Nat's Folly, Nat's Rollerboat, but there's very little I know about it. I uh, knew one of the captains at Prescott. Uh, he worked with me at Dan Boatline, Mr. Gorman Elkerton. He was a skipper and he knew about it. That's the first time I'd ever heard of it. Well, today I'm going to hear more about it. And uh, this is the gentleman who does know. If it's, if you get trapped by Ron, and he launches into one of the stories. One will launch into the other. I've known him some time, and I've never heard the same story twice. Like Captain Hogan. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome Ron Beaupre. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm always working on something new. It never stops. And one of my projects was passed along to me by uh, the late Captain Jerry Oderkirk, is the, the story of Captain Grant Pike, who was born here in Wolf Island in 1886 and died of a heart attack in 1943. Now, in my office, my phone has call display, and I'm working away on the Grant Pike story, and the phone starts to ring, and I look at the call display, and it says, Grant Pike. <laughs> 
So thanks for the call, Grant. Much appreciated, but it was a little spooky. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about uh, a very unusual craft called the roller boat. That is not a beer can. That is a, a steamboat going across Toronto Bay. So I'm going to talk about this. And if you were living on uh, the shores of Wolf Island back around 1910, you would have seen this thing going by. Yeah, because it did make a couple passages. So I'll get started on this. I'm going to be reading from uh, the Toronto Mean Historical Society publication, The Scanner. The editor is my friend uh, Jay Bascom. In 2023, uh, Lake Navigation season brought with it the 126th anniversary of the appearance on Toronto Bay of one of the most unusual vessels ever to have been seen there or anywhere else in the world, for a matter of fact. Indeed, there is not much doubt that Frederick Knapp's roller boat was one of the most unusual vessels ever seen anywhere on the lakes. She was built right there in Toronto on the waterfront. But although intended to revolutionize navigation, she was such a remarkable failure that she was nicknamed Knapp's Folly by contemporary observers and writers. So that's Fred Knapp. He's the father of the roller boat as the craft became known because it was never officially documented and it was never originally actually have a name painted on it. Frederick Augustus Knapp, a lawyer and inventor of note, was born at Prescott, Ontario on the 4th of February, 1854. He was son of Van Rensselaer Knapp and Amelia Spencer and was a member of one of Prescott's oldest families. He graduated from McGill University, Montreal in 1877 and practiced law in Montreal for a number of years before returning to carry on a law practice in his hometown. Frederick Knapp was an inventor at heart and spent many years, particularly during his retirement from the law, with his experiments and inventions. Predeceased by his wife, the former Eleanor Lydia Blackie, who passed on in 1936, Fred Knapp died at his home, the manor, at Prescott on Monday, September 14, 1942, at the age of 88, he was buried in the Blue Church Cemetery on Highway 2 west of Prescott and was survived by five of his six children. Oh, I hope this works. So, somehow we got this idea that developing a roller boat would be a, a great idea and he got some of his inspiration because it had been done before by a French inventor. And uh, here we have a boat that was actually built. You can see there are people standing upon it. And it has six large wheels that are rotating to drive the boat across the water. And we're thinking that that's when he discovered that, he got his idea for the roller boat that he had built in Toronto. So this is a diagram that was uh, drawn up for him by a naval architect thinking, well, maybe if you get it to turn like a propeller, you can get the thing to roll forward. So that didn't turn out uh, quite what he wanted. So he came up with another design. And there it is. So here we have a number of letters, and I'm just going to cover part of it. The letter H are spiders that connect the hull. You can find the letter H on there somewhere. Letter I, stationary hulls for passenger and freight. So there's the letter I there. So this part of the hull is supposed to mean be stationary, this part of the hull will roll when it's driven by that steam engine. So there's the steam engine and there's the crankshaft there that is supposed to, so it's on, the shaft is on bearings and then that there's the connection between the outer hull and the inner hull. So when the steam engine cranks, it turns the outer hull and these are the paddles that are connected on the exterior of the hull in several places. So 
So he calls this platform that sits outside at both ends the pilot house. Uh, o, P, and Q are drags that extend down into the water. So if you want it to turn one direction, you put this drag in the water, pull this drag out of the water, and this end will pivot around. And then you can, that's how you steer it. By, and it's just a matter of using uh, chains and come alongs, I guess, that would pull the drag up and let it go back down again. And there it is, Freddy Knapp Marine Vessel. Patented April 13th, lucky day. 1897. So here's an end view. Now here it's uh, a tubular boat that has a, well that looks like a two-cylinder steam engine connected to a drive shaft propeller and None of this makes any sense to me because I don't see anywhere you're going to put cargo in and take it out. But he had lots of dreams about how this was all going to, uh, to work. None of which really made much sense to anybody. Um, the plans for a vessel of such a size, and see he, uh, thought that the bigger is better. She could not have opened uh, any of the narrow channels or in most, most ports. Um, he actually thought that if you could build one that's 200 feet in diameter, and this, is, this part here is 80 feet in diameter, then you could load tremendous volumes of cargo on board and he even tried to persuade the American Navy that you could land 20,000 troops in one of these machines on the beach you roll the thing right up on the beach and everybody could walk off without even getting their feet wet but he forgot a couple of the basic principles one of them is water is a non-compressible fluid so you get this beast out in, in 30 foot waves in a storm in the Atlantic, it's not going to climb over the waves, it's going to go with them wherever they want it to go. Along with, if you had something that's 200 feet high and only drawing 10 feet of water, the wind's going to take it wherever it wants to take it and there's nothing you can do to stop it. So his logic uh, sort of defied the imagination. Here it is under construction in Toronto Harbor, built by Polsons. The rolling boat was constructed by Polson Ironworks Company at its yard in the old, unextended Toronto waterfront. Located south of the Esplanade and between the foot of Sherburne and Frederick Streets, as described in the Canadian Engineer, while it was under construction during the summer of 1897. The roller boat was 110 feet long and 22 feet in diameter, with the inner cylinder having an outside diameter of about 12 feet. The engine and platform or cabin for passengers will be placed inside this cylinder, the engine running on a track and turning the cylinder just as a squirrel might turn the cylinder in a cage. So did people keep squirrels in cages back in 1897? We're not sure. The engine being started climbs up its track and turns the drum by its own weight the drum moving over the water by means of paddles projecting from the outer shell by about a foot. The steering gear consists of a steel blade on the leeboard principle projecting down into the water from each end and lifted or lowered by chains. The smoke will escape by pipes from either end, the inner cylinder being of course open at the ends. Here's another photograph of it a little bit further along. And Apparently, the outer hull was going to be divided up into several different bulkheads all the way around so that if it ran into an obstruction and put a hole in it, it would only be one little chamber that got flooded. 
apparently because he did intend on rolling this thing right up on the beaches and then off again. But not to worry, you can patch it up while it's still afloat. So there is the inner hull that's going to hold the steam engines and apparently passenger and cargo. So would you be comfortable as a passenger in this thing, like those poor folks that just got lost in the Atlantic off the wreck of the Titanic? I don't think so. So there's another clearer shot. You can see by the size of the men that are working there that the cargo hold passenger accommodations is that space where they are, that gentleman is leaning against the side of the hull in there. And there's a fellow working away on putting things together there on the outer hull. So this part here is not really fastened to that part there. They're separate and just by the weight of the, ste the steam engine at both ends being positioned here on a platform, once you start driving the outer hull around, this is sitting on gimbals and it's just going to stay put. Mr. Knapp believes his new boat will make a speed of a mile a minute. And in so, it may be rolling before a gale, but going against the gale, it would be quite a different matter. It seems ungracious to have to discourage a thing before its trial, but it is to be feared that Mr. Knapp has not made any mathematical calculations for the enormous force of a gale acting on the broad side of so large a drum elevated by so largely out of the water. And he has evidently not considered that Though his engines are to be of 150 horsepower, their effective power will be limited to proportion of their weight plus that of the framework, etc., in which they are set. These are other difficulties which are likely to crop up on trial. And so criticism of Knapp's folly had begun even before she was in the water. That was not at all surprising because the roller boat was such a drastic change from anything known on Lake Marine circles up to that time. Leap shipping, shipping was fairly traditional and conservative enterprise, and the whalebacks of Alexander McDougall were about the most far out things that Lakes had seen until Knapp's roller boat came along, that is. So there it is actually in the water. So there's the outboard platform there at one end. There's the smokestack from the steam engine with a little bit of steam coming out of it. And these little blades here are the paddles that are supposed to propel the thing across the water. So uh, as built, the roller boat was indeed a strange sight. She was placed, she was a long tube with small and seemingly ineffectual longitudinal ribs placed around the outer shell amidships to serve as paddles. The two bends were tapered inward at each end as like uh, in an uncut cigar with a circular opening 15 feet in diameter at each end. Two stovepipes stuck out and up, one at each end to vent the boilers, and they produced copious clouds of black smoke when the boat was operating. There was no pilot houses at the ends as in Knapp's original plans, but rather at each end was placed a small and rather rickety looking open platform with a simple wooden railing around it. The platform were, of course, attached to the inner structure, not the outer one so that they would remain level when not, and not revolve as the outer hull turned. According to a, an article appearing in the Toronto Telegram of September 9, 1897, instead of having a heavy stationary cylinder around which the outer part would revolve, it was decided to have nothing at all in the center of the hull. At either end, there was to be a platform resting on wheels, which would touch the revolving part. This platform will be weighted and remain stationary. On the platform will be placed two engines, some sources said as many as four, with upright boilers behind them. These engines would transmit power to a huge driving wheel 
placed between them. And this wheel, by a system of cogs, caused the hull to revolve. There will be a platform similarly equipped at each end of the hull. The platform each travel on four big driving wheels and weigh about 15 tons with engines and boilers complete. So here we are looking into the interior of this roller boat and you can see that indeed there are wheels that are going to ride on rails that are circular here all the way around. There's a stationary boiler that would be operated by an engineer keeping the steam up and throwing coal into it to keep it going. So you're in the interior looking out from the interior. So this is the platform that weighs about 15 tons with an engine and boiler and a pile of coal in the interior. Again, where is your cargo space? Where are passengers going to reside when they're riding in the boat? And how do they get uh, anything in and out without having to pass through the boiler room? Lots of good questions. So later on, the engines are ready to be put into position and the four big flywheels are being finished. They are each four feet across and the belt surface of, is of paper which is put on a great pressure and bolted in between the flanges. On each shaft is a sprocket wheel and chain. We'll gear each to the shaft driving the wheels that will carry the platform around inside the cylinder. There will be mechanisms to lock the machinery so that the platform cannot run around on their ways and the cylinder will be stationary on the water. The paddle wheels will likely run the whole length of the boat. And as we have stated, they weren't, and instead of rather, and they're instead of rather short, and only stand out about two inches. They will not feather as they will pull up out of the water straight on account of the rate of speed of the boat. If a storm throws the boat on shore, she will just lie there until it subsides and then roll off and turn the injured spot upright for repairs which cannot be disastrous as the boat is full of air tight bulkheads. So going forward to uh, the fall of 1897, Wednesday, September the 8th, all day long, the workmen have been busy making preparations for the strange craft to make her short journey into what is finally hoped her inventor will be her native element. At a given signal, the boat was released and rolling over and over, went swiftly into the muddy waters of the Polson Slip, revolved for a short time and then settled into the water to a depth of about two and a half feet. A cheer arose from the assembled spectators and the history of Knapp's roller boat was advanced another stage. All that was launched yesterday was the Tudor outer, outer revolving cylinders. The inner or stationary cylinder will be put into place immediately together with 200 horsepower engines in about a month's time. On Monday, October 18, 1897, on Saturday afternoon, about 1,000 persons gathered down at the foot of Sherburne Street where it was understood that the Knapp roller boat would be given a trial. Fires were up and the big smokestacks belched forth clouds of smoke while steam hissed from the escape valves. The smoke and steam kept the crowd waiting for a couple hours, but nothing resulted, and they were obliged to go away without gratification. Mr. Polson said that the test was merely to see if the engines or boilers were all right, and there was no intention of starting the craft out for a trip. On October 19th, the newspaper reported the trial trip would not be made before the following afternoon, but it was not until the 21st the same paper noted that the preliminary trial trip of the Knapp roller boat was made around 1.30 this afternoon in the slip opposite the Polson Works. The boat made two revolutions without mishap, although the vibrations were somewhat violent. The smokestacks oscillated freely. However, the inventor, Mr. Knapp, regarded the trial as satisfactory and this afternoon, the steam launch cruiser will tow the boat out into the lakes for a prolonged trial. Another view of the assembly. And finally, here we are out in 
Toronto Harbor. On Friday, October 22nd, the Globe reported that after the first trial held in the Polson slip, the Polson company wanted Mr. Goodwin to take her off their hands. That they claiming that they had fulfilled their contract to Mr. Goodwin. He was actually the engineer in charge of the project. However, Goodwin objected to taking the boat over until and she had been tried in the open bay, as if it was Polson's fault whether or not it was going to work. So finally, Mr. Goodwin took over the boat and it is now his property. So at 3 o'clock, the cruiser started out, the long, ungainly craft towing behind her and accompanied by a flotilla of small boats. By that time, the moors were black with thousands of spectators. And you can actually see the actual, there is the little paddle right there at the top and there's another one just coming up out of the water. So the roller boat is going away from the photographer in this picture. So there's not really much in the way of propulsion, just that little blade in the first go. In the center of the bay was reached, the tow rope was cast off and a sharp whistle from the cruiser told Mr. Gardner Boyd, who was in charge of the roller boat, that he'd go ahead as soon as he liked. There was an answering whistle from the new boat, the noise of escaping steam and the great circular tube with its flanges or paddles commenced to revolve in the water and go slowly ahead. The platforms on either end of the new boat swayed up and down and when the revolution of the flanges commenced, but soon as the boat got well underway, the platforms became level and steady. In a minute it could be seen that the experiment was a success for gathering speed, although no time moving very fast through the water, the roller boat steadily made her way up the bay towards the western entrance. Those in the fleet of small boats that followed the new craft cheered lustily while snapshots from Kodaks were being taken from the cruiser and the ferry Ada Alice, which kept the roller boat company. No attempt was made to go at any rate of speed, the new machinery in the first place precluding any idea of making fast time. Then too, the paddles or flanges were only temporary. They were wooden flanges fixed in the center of the boat and extending for hardly a quarter of its length. To those on board the cruiser, it appeared that these flanges were not long enough. The new ones probably would be fitted from end to end of the boat. In the course of the trials, one of the flanges broke off. At which boat, the boat stopped, then rolled back while the floating flange was picked up. Then she went through the water. The boat drew within a half an inch of three feet, an abnormal depth as Mr. Knapp considers. When the new flanges are put in, the boat will draw less water. Yes, Mr. Knapp, by adding weight, it's going to go higher up in the water. <laughs> right. Mr. Knapp contends that the tendency will be for the boat to approach the surface the faster it goes. So it's actually going to climb up on the surface. Yes, of course. Yesterday, the boat made about six revolutions to the minute. And Mr. Knapp propounded the, a conundrum to the newspaper man when he asked, if it makes this speed at six revolutions, how fast will it go when it makes 60 to 70? Well, which we expect it will be able to do. Everybody gave it up. The fastest revolution made yesterday was in seven seconds. The engines were geared one to two, but will be geared two to one, which will make it very materially increase the speed of the boat. The platforms where the crew were stationed were not the most comfortable places as the steam and water from the exhaust pipe had a rather moistening effect on, to those on board. The rumbling and pounding noise made by the roller boat while underway rather startled those within earshot as they thought something must be wrong with the machinery. For an hour of the trial, about an hour, the trial was continued and the boat rolled up and down the bay and across in the direction of the islands. Those on board were not familiar with the steering apparatus so there was no effect, effort to direct the boat in any way that she could go. She simply rolled in the direction of her broadside on, leaving a swift current behind her and not throwing up much water at front at all. At four o'clock, the cruiser whistled to stop and the roller boat was taken in tow for a few minutes and then she was back at her old mooring in the poles and slip. 
Patrick Augustus with the trial trip. The Toronto Evening News of Thursday, October 28, 1897, reported that Knapp's rollerboat was taken out of the bay yesterday afternoon and given another trial. Since the first trip, double the number of flanges and paddles have been put on the boat. The cruiser, with a large, large party of ladies and gentlemen on board, steamed out but got stuck in the mud on, in the channel. The roller boat was taken out into the bay and rolled eastward. One of the rudders was put into operation and the crew was able to steer the boat in any direction they pleased. The same article indicated Mr. Knapp was thinking of selling his roller boat and then building a second one, 250 feet in length and 50 feet in diameter and taking the boat to the Atlantic Ocean. The Owen Sound Sun on November 2nd, 1897, even had a comment considering the roller boat. And it came from no less than author an authority than the eminent Captain John Simpson, who knew a thing or two about ships and their construction. The article headed, doesn't think much of it. Captain John Simpson expresses an opinion on Knapp's roller boat and continued, in a conversation the other day, Captain Simpson, the well-known shipbuilder, told the Sun that in his opinion, the Knapp roller boat, which had been built at the Polson Yards, Toronto, and about which so much has appeared in the papers, will never be a practical success. Captain Simpson says he, he was through the boat from stem to stern, if nautical phrases can be applied to the huge cylinder, and while it may be possible that she will roll and perhaps develop a good speed, the invention is extremely unlikely to be utilized for practical purposes. In the first place, Captain Simpson cannot see how any accommodation could possibly be made for either freight or passengers. There is no place where a person can stand excepting on the platform on which the engines are placed and as the ends of the cylinder are open, Everyone inside is exposed to the inclemencies of the weather. Then added the captain, what would happen if such a vessel, while crossing the Atlantic or any other large body of water, got caught in such a storm as often blows up? A single wave would sweep through her and send her to the bottom in a second. Anyone who has traversed the high seas knows what the waves are sometimes like, why they are sometimes almost too much for the big liners that have very much provision for shedding water. I have seen a wave come right up over the stern of a vessel and sweep her from end to end. No, I haven't a very high opinion of Mr. Knapp's roller boat. Neither did the Scientific American which published several articles about the roller boat during the autumn of 1897, its criticisms centered mainly on considerations of wind and water resistance, and the conclusion of its November 13th article that the roller boat's trial trips did not give any reason to expect that the marine greyhounds of the future will move over instead of through the sea. So there's another shot, a different angle of the roller boat. Again, going away from the photographer so you can see that the water is being pushed by the, the blade coming up out of the water. And when they say that these are non-feathering, when they invented the paddle wheel steamers, the blades went flat into the water like this and came out like that. And so as they came out up, they lifted the water up which slowed the engine down because the, now the engine is working, lifting water up out of the lake like this. So when they said they were feathering, they would be on a crank, they would turn and come straight in to the water like this and paddle back and then lift straight out without having to lift any water up. So these are non-feathering paddles. So the bigger you make them, the more water they lift up as you're going around in a circle. So there's uh, additional paddles. Um, the first installment of our uh, 
Even after the roller boat proved that she could roll across the water, there were many observers who questioned the practicality of the ship. Most of the detractors were worried about the effects of wind or heavy seas on the, the boat's ability to roll. Only the prominent lake shipbuilder, Captain John Simpson, dared to raise the question of what useful purpose the roller boat could serve, considering that the hull of the vessel did not provide any space sufficient for the carriage of either freight, passengers, or, or perhaps could roll, whatever her rolling could achieve. Some interesting insight into the uh, thoughts of the roller boat's inventor, Frederick Knapp, were provided by C.H.J. Snyder in his Schooner Days, which appeared in the Evening Telegram in Toronto on Saturday, September 26, 1942. Snyder's interest was sparked by the death of Knapp only 12 days before the appearance of the article. Snyder included much information that had come to him from Captain W.J. Stitt, late of Toronto, whose father, a resident of Prescott and proprietor of the ironworks there, had assisted Knapp with his plans. The elder Stitt also assisted with the construction of the roller boat, but wisely, we would think, left the project partway through in order to take position of lockmaster at Old Lock 27 of the Gallup Canal, 10 miles east of Prescott. From Captain Stitt, we have a quotation from an unidentified Quebec City newspaper furnished before roller boat had run our trials. Mr. F.A. Knapp, the well-known inventor of the roller boat, is in the Shadow Frontenac. He has been here for two days and leaves this evening for England. To those who know nothing about Mr. Knapp's revolutionary ideas of steam-carrying boats, his proposition cannot be regarded with any great degree of faith. But to meet the gentleman, converse with him, and see his plans and drawings of the boat, which is to have a trial as soon as he returns from abroad, is to readily believe that his new mode of carrying freight and passengers is quite possible. In fact, to the unprejudiced and ordinary intelligent person, the problem seems quite possible. The problem seems quite plausible, but outside the main object, object of Mr. Knapp's new roller boat, which will cross the ocean, he has certainly achieved a great success in inventing a boat which will carry grain from the west through the canals cheaper by only 50% than any other boat now in existence. The boat is a floating grain elevator as well and will therefore create a saving as much money. This is one reason Mr. Knapp's special visit to Quebec to see the Board of Trade and other bodies connected with transportation. In his, in his first visit to the ancient capital, he is looking for a port to make the largest grain shipping port in the world. It will be larger than the largest anywhere by many millions of bushels. Among those who will be present at the trials will be J. Pierpont's Morgan's chief engineer, J.J. Hill, principal man in many, of many other enterprises from all transportation bodies in the U.S. and Canada. The success of this great trial, gigantic, gigantic as it may seem, means the expenditure of many millions of dollars in Quebec in the making of the city but we still don't know how a roller boat could get through the old canals. So, in any event, the roller boat did no more rolling in the on autumn of 1897, and she spent the winter at Toronto, and in April of 1898, Knapp was back at it with his boat. Now, in this picture that was taken in Prescott, you can see a lot of changes have been made. First of all, the blades now go all the way from one end to the other. And in this picture, the engines have been removed. Uh, he was in process of trying to get bigger engines and fit it into it. So now he's uh, going back to Toronto. He's out there experimenting again. The boat got up to it and he's done another trial. So now we're in 1898. The boat got up on a fairly good line of speed too. It started for the Eastern Gap, right in the teeth of the wind and went fairly well. So much steam and smoke was thrown out from, that the vessel was soon hidden away and seemed like a war vessel under fire. The roller boat passed out to the Eastern Gap, had its first introduction to Lake Ontario took a turn or two and came back into the harbor. 
The boat will leave today or tomorrow for Prescott. Only four or five men will go down, and the boat will be accompanied by a tug. It is expected that the distance will be made in one day. And he said, I am quite satisfied with the boat. She has done everything I expected of her. I have found several defects, but these will be remedied on the next boat I will build. And yes, I intend building another vessel. She will be constructed entirely under my supervision. The paddle area on this vessel I have found quite entirely inadequate. It is 75% too small. And I have also found the present system of two engines mitigates against the speed of the vessel. My next boat will be built with one single engine placed in the center of the boat. I mean, new construction will also have paddles running her entire length, 180 feet. She will be proportionally much lighter than the present craft, and I expect to attain incredible speed. When asked what he would do with the current roller boat, Knapp stated he would all probably take her down to Prescott and tie her up. She has rolled he said, and that is all expected of her. She has fully demonstrated the principle. Articles appearing in the April and of uh, the Toronto Evening Telegram mentioned this and they had a half-tone picture. Despite the suggestion that the Norwood boat would uh, go to Prescott after the weather improved in the spring of 1898, there were no further reports of the boat rolling at all during the rest of the 1898 season. Nevertheless, Knapp and his rollers did make the, the news in 1898. The Detroit Free Press carried an article credited to the Buffalo Express and fittingly entitled, Fine Thing for Target Practice. It is reported from the Toronto from Toronto that the inventor Knapp, who has won notoriety, if not fame, for designing a rolling boat, is about to descend upon the Navy Department at Washington with plans for rolling Navy. Mr. Knapp's experiment with this strange craft in Toronto Harbor last summer are fresh in the minds of people of the lakes, and it is therefore with considerable awe that one reads of the proposal the inventor intends to make to the Washington authorities. He asserts that he can build a boat 200 feet high in three months and that it will be an ideal troop ship. It would be capable of carrying 30,000 men and would, of course, be much faster than any of the ordinary vessels at present running on the ocean. As the boat would draw a little water, it could get very close to land. It would not need to enter any particular port, says the inventor, it could land troops at any point on the shores of Cuba. The boat, too, could carry 60,000 tons of freight and it could be used as a coal boat with 60,000 tons of coal on board. The rolling boat would be a movable coaling station for the fleet. Both ends of the boat could be armed with guns so that the enemy could be, would be unable to take it. It is said that Senor Dubois, the first secretary of the Spanish leg legation, to the United States, inspected the craft at Toronto a few days ago and advised Mr. Knapp to open negotiations with the Spanish government with a view to selling it a boat. This should be done at all means. A craft 200 feet high and rolling around like a porpoise would be a beautiful thing for the American sailors to shoot at. Needless to say, no more rolling boats were ever constructed, whether Knapp, Frederick Knapp finally realized the uselessness of his craft is questionable. We cannot think of the lack of financial backing of what most would likely did consider Knapp's continued experiments with his boats that rolled. So in June of 1899, it was reported the roller boat was being readied at Polson Stock for yet another trial with a departure for Prescott possible later in the week. In June 8th of 1899, it was reported the roller boat had not left that afternoon as anticipated, but would leave, leave the following day at 7 o'clock. Only one engine would be used for the trip, but the second would be fired up if necessary. A report carried that once at Prescott, roller boat would be readied for use as a passenger ferry between Prescott and Augensburg to prepare her for this trade. The, the two engines would be replaced by one powerful engine to be located in the center of the vessel's length. 
and the wooden flange paddles will be replaced by steel strips running the full length of the hull, which is in this picture. It's odd because the ferry service was a licensed service and you can't really just engage in a service like that without permission. So on Friday, June 9th and Saturday, June 10th, confirming the roller boat had indeed cleared Polson Slip by 7.20 on the 9th, bound for Prescott. Progress, however, was painfully slow and reports indicated that it took her two hours to cross the bay to the Eastern Gap as Knapp let the other three men in his crew get accustomed to the boat. Full speed was reported to have been ordered once the boat had cleared the gap, and when she was observed by the Niagara excursion steamer Garden City at 11.30 a.m., rollerboat was still only two miles past the island breakwater. The evening news concluded that it was not at all likely that the new record for the trip down the lake would be established, and that whether the boat reaches there, Prescott or not, is a question. Turned out to be a very good question indeed, for a roller boat had not traveled very tired down the lake before trouble was encountered. The Mail and Empire of Tuesday, June 13th, reported Knapp's roller boat, which left Toronto on Friday, is ashore two miles west of here, Bowmanville, being where the story originated. They have sent to Prescott for a tug to tow them to that place, expected to get away tomorrow. The evening news carried a somewhat different version of the events in this edition of June 14th, running an article dated Kingston. Mr. F.A. Knapp, inventor of the roller boat, arrived here by Grand Trunk Railway Express from Bowmanville, where his boat now lies. A large crowd of people were disappointed on the non-arrival of his famous construction. Mr. Knapp tells a somewhat thrilling story of his trip from Toronto. It is as follows. The roller boat left Toronto Friday morning, having on board the owner and fireman Holderness, engineer Mr. Robertson. It was not the intention of the inventor to make any trial of speed, but simply to bring the boat to Prescott to have her practically rebuilt. Only one engine was used on the way down, and the corresponding engine at the port end had been disconnected. All went well until the boat came opposite Frenchman's Bay, about nine miles west of Whitby, and it was found that the paper mache used as an outside covering on the double flange wheels, causing the rotation of the hull, had given out. This occasioned much delay and loss of steam, and so much that the coal gave out, and the boat was for the, mo for the time helpless. To make matters worse, a gale came up from the north, sprang up, and drifted the boat seven miles out from the north shore. And seeing that he was likely to drift to the American side of the lake, Mr. Knapp cast an anchor, but the force of the wind was such that the anchor dragged. Then Mr. Knapp and Mr. Farini, the aerialist and adventurer that went on, was on board, decided to row ashore for help. After three hours in the turbulent sea, they reached the little village of Frenchman's Bay and thence down to Pickering, three miles to the north. Here they managed to arrange for a steam launch and a barge of coal. The roller head was discovered 15 miles out on the lake on Saturday morning. The engineer and fireman sticking manfully by their craft. I, yeah, understandably, if the only boat they have has gone ashore, what else are you going to do, swim for it? <laughs> Steam was got up and the roller reached Womanville at 8 o'clock. And of course it went ashore. Mr. Knapp says he has demonstrated beyond doubt that his boat will steer easily, and when improvements he intends making are completed, he will prove his novel craft to be all that he promised, the roller being likely to arrive Prescott on Wednesday. Well, actually, uh, when they did manage to get some coal on board, it was in, was in sacks, and they did get steam up again, but actually the wind swapped around and came from the southwest, and drove the thing ashore at, uh, on a bluff at Rabby Head, some five miles east of the entrance to Oshawa Harbor and two miles west of Port Donington. As a precaution against another wind change, Knapp secured the roller boat to a tree by means of a hawser. And there the roller boat lay for five weeks. Knapp hoped to have a tug pull the, 
his craft off easily off the beach and take her to Port Darlington. But this turned out not to be possible. Local residents took advantage of the roller boat's unexpected arrival to, on their shore to inspect the strange ship, and many locals picnicked at nearby Men's Point while watching the salvage operation being conducted by the Kingston Wrecking Company. Finally, on Friday, July 14, 1899, one of the Wrecking Company's tugs managed to pull a roller boat off the beach and began the long tow to Prescott. Roller boat had only made some 40 miles of the journey under her own power and given lie to Knapp's claim that a rolling boat would be a good landing for troops on any shore and could easily be rolled off the shore should she ever go aground. So the roller boat successfully completed the tow to Prescott and arrived there in May 12, 1900. As indicated, another tested roller boat was to be made on the 12th. And he actually tried to, uh, it was later on in that fall, actually got into a, a winter storm. And they tried to cross uh, over to Argensburg in a snowstorm. And only managed to run the thing up on a mud bank that's, uh, that extends out from the, the mouth of the Ostrogotchi River, where it's stranded up on the mud bank. And he claimed that he had made a successful trip again. So there's another picture of it. And this is uh, some photographs that I discovered in um, the Marine and Rail Museum in Prescott, and here they are walking over to Knapp's roller boat on the ice. And I believe the gentleman with the bowler hat on is Fred Knapp. And there he's the one on the right, that's Fred Knapp. And he's still very much promoting his watercraft as being something that will uh, revolutionize the marine industry forever and uh, it didn't work out very well. They actually had the thing towed through the canals down to Montreal, where he got them to try to convert it into a steamboat with a propeller and a wheelhouse and hatches. So now uh, everything is stationary. The stern is closed in. There's a smokestack at the stern and a propeller extending out underneath, and they had a partially erected spoon-shaped bow, and they tried to use it as a steamboat for a period of time, and there it is, with the Union Jack flying at the forward mast. It's got a pilot house and a sawmill smokestack, and the bow is now enclosed. It's hard to see, but there is a bow enclosed there. And they did make a few trial trips to it. Didn't, they succeeded in losing money, never made any money out of it. And ended up in Toronto Harbor, abandoned, lying in the mud for several years. And there it is. Somebody is in the process of getting it, uh, taking it apart and scrapping it. But it laid there in the mud, cut down more and more. There is a ship coming off the ways in 1917 out of Polson Shipyard, and there is the wreck of the roller boat lying in the mud. And this is the one of the last pictures taken of it. Now, there is the coal cold storage plant that's on the, the, the shore of the extended waterfront. So this is the old waterfront over here and it gradually got built out and out and out like this over here. And once you're looking at this gap, that is the Toronto Harbor Commission uh, main headquarters. This is the Gardner Expressway with Lakeshore Boulevard underneath it, what goes right over top of the wreck. 
and that's where it is today, buried under the lake, under the Gardner Expressway. And that was the end of Knapp's roller boat. So if anybody has any questions uh, regarding the roller boat, I'll try to answer them. <laughs> so that's about it. Well, I think if uh, you find somebody that's gullible and you're very persuasive, you can manage to get them to agree that your idea is a good one and they come up with the money. There was a lot of litigation between Polson's and Mr. Knapp's company about unpaid bills. It ended up, they, they seized the boat, it was tied up and waiting for, and there were court appearances that dragged on and on for years. The boat broke away from the Murrays of the storm, sailed across the harbor and went around and collided with one of the uh, harbor ferries, did some damage, a couple hundred dollars. So then there was a lien against the boat and so on that went to court and uh, I guess whoever paid 200 bucks for the to scrap the boat, that money went to the Harbor Ferry Commission. But basically, it, uh, to me, it was a fraud right from the get-go. But he did manage to get it built, and it got out in the bay and rolled around a few times, and then he tried to make it to Prescott, and they ran out of coal. And they very quickly discovered, yeah, it'll go wherever the wind wants to take it. And you don't have enough horsepower to take it where you want it to go. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am? How are they thermal? Okay, um, blades. So if, uh, can I borrow your thermal? Sure, can. Let me cork it there, sure. Yeah, okay. So here's the boat on the surface and there's a blade like this down in the water so that's what they call a drag so if you are rolling along and both blades are out of the water you're just going in the general direction where it's turning but if you drop a blade down like this a drag then it'll turn this way until you pull the drag up again now if you want to turn back you drop this blade down, and that's a drag, and it turns it like this. That's how they steer it. Ron, could you control it from the one end, like say you're on the port end, and you want them to drop the starboard? Could you control it from that? Well, they had far they end? had to have somebody. Uh, oh, on either end. On either end. Okay. And I don't know if you only had one helmsman, if you want to call it that. There's no you steering wheel. So you <laughs> tell them, you know. Yeah. So even like, I guess you know when they had something that this is forward and that's, but to me it didn't matter if you turn it around and, and go like this. Like there's no bow, no stern, no port, no starboard. It's like a, like I say, a beer can floating on the water, or your thermos. <laughs> yeah, whoever's. On the platform, you're standing out there with the steam escaping, and you know, and. and they're going to do that all the way over the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he had all kinds of ideas that he's going to have windows and all this stuff, and yeah, I, I just imagine something that's 200 feet in diameter. That's when the like the Spanish and the Americans weren't getting along. He said, "Yeah, we'll we'll get one, and when the Americans run out of ammunition, that's when we win the war." Yeah, yeah, just a few years, and then he tried to make it into a tubular boat, and again, as soon as he uh, came up with an idea, immediately it was one of the, it's going to revolutionize the shipping industry. But the thing is, in order to get from the Upper Lakes all the way down to St. Lawrence, you had to go through a canal. And canals are shaped like this, they're not round, right? So to maximize your cargo, the hull is the same shape as the lock, and you get... The most, 
the maximum amount of cubic space that you can get into that lock. They, over in the United States, you're going to build a canaler for a service in the Great Lakes. They would come to, the, to Cornwall to one lock, I think it was lock, might have been lock 22, because there was one, of, one wall of that lock had actually caved in a few inches at the top. And they would make a ship that fit that lock just. And it would be cambered in like this, the same slope as the wall in that lock. Just to be sure that you got absolutely every pound of cargo you could get through. Now, mind you, if you got a loaded boat trying to push your way into that lock, you had to push all that water out from underneath it and beside it. And they'd have cables going forward, pulling with the engine going at the same time to get the thing in the lock and displace all that water. But a, a roller boat never made any sense to anybody. How you could ship grain from the Canadian lakehead to Quebec City in a boat that's shaped like a tube didn't make any sense. So that's the story of the roller boat. Now, yes, Wolf Islanders would have seen this thing going by because it did make trips to Prescott, back to Toronto, down the river. So it usually under tow, <laughs> not rolling down the river. I can't imagine what. So it was actually being towed, partially built into a tubular boat up through the old St. Lawrence River. And they didn't even, where the plates on the bow came up, there were sharp edges that kept cutting through the tow rope. The thing actually got away from them and started heading down into the rapids and they managed to recover it again. So it was a nightmare from the get-go at all times. Any other questions? Well, it's not, not, a, not a question really, thank you, great talk, but just a comment. We've spoken about wind, and of course, we've seen the effect of the wind on the fort already. A, a boat of that nature going down the river with the current behind it would have very little well, capability to, uh, to resist it. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, running the old river was quite a challenge before they built the seaway and settled it, and they, they, they brought the, the current down considerably. It was all part of the plan. In the old river, they would run the rapids from between Iroquois and Morrisburg. That was called the Gallup Rapids. And you just went with it. I had talked to it. There was a place there, there was a rock, a smooth rock, called the Jump. And there was a, a whirlpool on the other side of the Jump that was so strong trying to turn the ship, that this guy said, you would steer to starboard to go to port. So the rapids were quite challenging um, going downbound with them. They had to be really good on the helm. But uh, these ships were designed with big rudders to have maximum steering capability. I'm talking about canalers. The roller boat was never built for canals or river, or even in the open lake, like this gentleman said, as soon as the wind catches it, it's gone. See ya. Did you say it was paper mache? Well, there was a, there was a wheel. I think it might that it, it, there was one wheel driving the other wheel, and they actually bonded paper mache onto one of these wheels, because steel on steel hasn't doesn't have any traction. So that's why they put they bonded the paper on there so that they could get the traction. And they just get it going out in the lake and the paper comes off and that's it, you, you're not going anywhere because you've lost your traction. <laughs> you know, every, it seemed as though everything that they tried just ended up you know, causing trouble. I guess that's it. Thank you very much for being here.